So let's keep in mind what these tests are really doing for us. These tests are the probabilistic shortcuts to understand what might happen by chance if the null hypothesis is true. First, let's think about the data as a single bivariate data set, which we foreshadowed above. The first variable for each person is their anxiety score, but the second variable will be their experimental group, a dichotomous variable indicating if they were in the E to H or H to E groups. Now, if there is no relationship between anxiety and the ordering of the test questions, then any difference between the groups should be attributable to random chance, and thus probably should be small. But what constitutes small? Well, we can do a simulation to get a sense of what small might be. Our assumption, the null hypothesis, says that the group means are the same. That is another way of saying that the groups come from the same population, because we've already assumed that the data is normal, and the variance of the populations is also the same. So if they do indeed come from the same population, and there's no substantive difference from the random assignment to the two treatment groups, then we should be able to shuffle the data and assign individuals to different groups and get comparable results. That is to say, relatively small results. If we do this shuffle, we can recalculate the group mean difference. Then we can imagine repeating this process many times, say a thousand times, 10,000 times, or even a million times. Once we've done this, we can get a sense of how big a difference we might see by chance alone, and then we can compare the difference we actually saw to what that spread of reasonable differences are, and then ask the question if our result was likely or not. So let's do this. Here is the distribution of the mean differences by random shuffling. Each shuffle resulted in 25 anxiety scores in the larger group, and the remaining 16 anxiety scores in the second group. We then take the difference of the means, Doing this one million times results in the following distribution of differences. From here, we can see where our actual data falls. More importantly, we can see that we would only obtain a mean difference, at least the size of ours, 0.8% of the time. That is, if the null hypothesis is true. The null hypothesis here is interpreted as there is no relationship between the test item ordering groups and the anxiety levels, i.e. the populations are the same. If we ask for a two-tailed p-value, we see that we only obtain sample means at least as large as ours in magnitude 1.9% of the time. Notice that this is reasonably close to the value we obtained using the t-test, 2.1%. The azure lines at either end are the smallest and largest possible mean differences we might obtain by shuffling the data. For the mathematically inclined, what are these values and how are they obtained? And for the very adventurous, how rare would they be to happen by random chance? Hint, the answer is about 1 in 100 billion. So, what really is the two-sample independent t-test? Well, it is a mathematical or a probabilistic shortcut to get us to this probability. Yes, we could obtain it by simulation, but only because we have powerful computers. When that wasn't the case, we needed another way to get to this answer. This is how the t-test was discovered and proven. Using this formula and protocol, we can obtain the p-value without having to do a million simulations. So, a quick comment about other t-tests that are possible. The other common two independent sample t-test is the one that relaxes the equal variance assumption. But this test only works for relatively larger sample sizes. The common requirement is that both samples should be at least 30 or both samples should be normally distributed. However, even this approach has its limitations. First, either a complicated formula needs to be used to calculate the degrees of freedom, or a very conservative and crude estimate for the degrees of freedom is used. 